number of, I think, eight or ten kind of specific use cases of AI in Ag today. I am fully capable of just talking for this whole hour. Anyone that knows me knows that, but it would be much better if we had a conversation. So like, you could just jump in with a question, and I'll repeat it for the group, and, um, and, and we'll go like that, and then we'll, we'll, we'll stop in time and you get to where you have to go to next. Um, maybe this thing is a little jumpy. One other thing I want to say, for, for the most part, the exception of a couple of things at the end, I'm not talking about kind of future, we're going to go do a use cases. These are systems that are in, in customer hands today that are in production. I threw a couple of pictures up there. That's a, that's a fully electric tractor. We built that years ago. Problem is, um, energy density is such that it only runs for a couple hours and it needs to run like 16 or 18. I say that to say we've been progressive in electrification for a good long while. The one on the bottom there, that's our first autonomous tractor. It's, if you're an undergrad, it's older than you. Um, so like we're, we're, we've been progressive with technology for a, for a good long while. Um, and I, I think I would suggest to you that advanced ag equipment it's the smartest, most advanced thing that stays tethered to the ground. And if you don't spend time in the egg space, I hope you'll get a sense of that as we, as we go through some, some different ideas. Super quickly about me, Matt shared some, some of my background. I'm the proud dad of, of two daughters, uh, Grace and Rose. Lori and I have been married for over 30 years. Uh, both of my kids are Illinois alum. Uh, my son-in-law is an Illinois alum. Uh, Rose's fiance is an Illinois alum. I have a, a dog, Fluffy. All my research park friends friends know Fluffy. She's 18 and a half years old. She's an icon. I also have, uh, as of last fall, a granddaughter, Ada. And being a grandparent is exactly as great as everybody says it is. Um, I used to be a civil engineer. I used to build airport infrastructure. And then in the late 90s, 32-bit computing, uh, Java, the web, kind of brought a whole bunch of us that didn't start like, in IT into that field, which is so much changing. Deer was hiring anybody that could spell TCP IP, so I ended up at Deer at the data center. Uh, I, I've, I've taken advantage of advancing my education, getting the graduate this May, and I've had a, a bazillion jobs uh, at Deer. I think I've had, I think this is my 17th uh, job in my years at Deer. And I've gotten to be all over wherever we use technology. Quickly about the office in Champaign, JD took us really three locations. We have the office on First Street, uh, a couple garages on Hazelwood, and then a test plot over uh, just off of Fourth Street. We've been here since about 2008. I haven't. I've been here since 2017, 2018. We added our first garage in 11. We expanded the office in 14. We added left field our test plot in 19. We added second garage in 22. So we continue to grow. We're still a very small facility, but we continue to grow. Um, we were the first corporate R&D facility, not in Moline, and uh, we became a part of our digital solutions group about three years ago. Like a good R&D center, we have continued to advance what we do. We started doing uh, electronics, and we did systems engineering. And for those of you that know Julian Sanchez, when Julian was down here, he got the office focused on mobile. When I came down, pivoted us more towards autonomy, and then a few years ago we moved to advanced sensing, and a few years from now we'll change again because that's the job for an R&D group. Deer is a very global, uh, very successful Fortune 100 company. Um, about half of our sales are outside of the US. Um, about half of our sales, actually a little more than half our sales, are not big ag equipment, although the big ag equipment is our favorite part. Um, and uh, over half of our workforce is actually outside of the US. Uh, we've been building our tech stack for about 25 years. Um, but the getting to a, a very advanced state didn't come, come quickly. Every ag company would have some version of this story. You know, it started a long time ago to get where we are today. Okay, quickly about ag and ag tech. Um, we have about 8 billion people in the world right now. We're headed for maybe it's 10 billion. To do that will take about 50% more food than we have today. <laughs> As people, that's because it's not just a growing population, but it's a growing middle class. As people join the middle class, usually means eating better, generally involves having some sort of protein in their diet. And it turns out that the stomachs of livestock are not the most efficient chemical processors. So it takes six or eight calories of grain to generate one calorie of protein. 
that step function is what means while we're increasing the world population by another 25 percent we have to increase the we have to increase the, the, the grains produced by 50 percent to feed the world not just to feed more people but to feed them better that tailwind is really significant for deer so 6,000 calories of grain becomes 900 calories of eggs as, as an example of how that translation occurs when we talk about ag for for, for you know, row crop, and that's where, where I'm mostly focused, it's you know, prepare, plant, protect, harvest. It's those four steps that happen every year. If you're a farmer, you know, planting and harvesting, those couple weeks in the spring, couple weeks in the fall, that's gonna define your success. That's really high pressure, um, and any, any technology that can help you be more successful during those weeks is, is generally pretty welcome. If you were to roll back the clock to about 1900, a farm wouldn't look terribly different than it did about 10,000 years before that. And I love this quote from Don Harlberg, a former Purdue professor. A farmer from Old Testament time could visit the American farm in the year 1900, he would have recognized and had the skill to use most of the tools he saw, the hoe, the plow, the harrow, the rake. The changes that have occurred since then exceed the magnitude of all changes during the previous 10,000 years. Think about that. Farming sat still for 98, 9900 years, and then it's been very, very much transformed since then. I like to bucket those transformations into kind of four big areas. Um, there's been a power tech revolution, and, and these aren't like it started and it stopped. These are all ongoing revolutions. There's been a biotech revolution, infotech revolution, and we're in the early beginnings of an AI revolution right now. These are all additives. This isn't either or all places where technology continues to compound. Um, deer is, is, is very strong in power tech, info tech, artificial intelligence. Biotech, you know, for the chemicals and biologicals, if, if those have to be spread in the field, we participate in that space. At some level, you'd say all of these areas are fighting for the farmer's dollar. Like, if you can make a farmer more productive, that's how you get resources. So, you know, we at some level, we're competing not just with other folks that make equipment, but anybody that generates productivity on the farm. <laughs> Agronomic output continues to go up and up and up, and if you were to compare it to the U.S. economy, you know, we're talking total factor productivity if you are of an economic spend, ag productivity has expanded much faster than the broader economy, much faster. Okay, um, enough about the background. Maybe I'll give this one motivating number Every year, there's about 10 trillion corn and soybean planted in the U.S. That's the scale of data science and ag. 10 trillion, and for each one of those, each one of those seeds, at some future point, we will know hundreds of things about each one of them. So the scale of agronomic data is really, really stunning. Another idea I want to talk to you about. We'll actually get into the AI stuff here. Um, this, I, I think I made this term up. Uh, but I want you to have the sense that there, there's a really thick technology stack that enables AI on the farm. And I'll call that the modern ag operating system. It's really these four building blocks. It's really high fidelity location, connectivity, cloud-based complex data services, and electrification. Let me say a little bit about each. Many of you may know that your phone has a GPS in it that is maybe, maybe a, like two meters or so accurate, right? Um, and then it does a lot of fancy software tricks to make it appear more accurate than that. And considering it's form factor and factor in price, that's really good. Um, our location solution, Starfire Receiver, is, is about two and a half centimeters accurate, re repeatedly over time. So we know exactly where we are in the field, and next time we come through the field, we'll be in that exact spot again. But that took literally a couple of decades to get there, and it involves a set of six from fixed base points around the world and some really fancy math and it's 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 a really 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 impressive system that really changes the way you think about automation autonomy repeatable operations in the field when you know exactly where you are that's a great foundational piece of technology connectivity telematics we have um, i think the last number i saw was over 600,000 connected machines that are able to call home at some frequency 
in total, if, if you look at all of the land that those 600,000 pieces of equipment cover, it's about a third of the land mass of the Earth. It's a lot of ground that our equipment is on. Cloud-based complex data services, if you are watching something on Netflix in the fall and it's performing poorly, there's a very good chance that we're the problem because we both move a lot of data to AWS. We are their largest customer for a few days in the fall. That's all the telematic data being streamed back during the harvest season. And then electrification, a full battery tractor, it'll come eventually. Right now there's just not the energy density for it. We make small equipment, small for us is like less than 100 horsepower. We can electrify it, we make that fully electric today. But even if it's not fully electric, having electricity available and be able to use that to actuate as opposed to hydraulics or pneumatics or some more traditional way to do it, the precise control you have with electrification has made some really, really, really cool things possible. So this is kind of the technology stack that sits under everything we do with AI. I, if, if I don't give you this baseline, I think maybe the rest of this doesn't make as, mad, as much sense. So I hope that that's useful. A couple examples of how those manifest. Um, I'll skip that one. We'll cover that well enough later. Look, look at this picture for a second. If you've farmed, or if you've had anything to do with farming, think about all the things that have to go right for that. Think about how that has to be planted. Think about every row being turned on and off at exactly the right time. Think about having to have strong enough path planning to know where to get started. Think about all the things it takes for that to occur. Compare that to how a field would have looked 20 years ago. I think that's a great picture for the process control that exists on a modern farm today. Um, you can tell when you're driving. I think we take advantage, take, take for granted, essentially perfectly straight rows at this point. That's new. That's not the way it's been traditionally done. When you were driving the tractor, that didn't happen. And it's also because we can know where we are reliably, that's what allows equipment to get bigger and bigger because we're past what a human can do at this point. You can see in the top left there, you can see slowed down, and this is where electrification becomes really, really powerful. Um, exactly placing the seed in the trench and then dosing it with, I think it's 0.2 milliliters of, of fertilizer, starter fertilizer, just to, just to get the plant going. Um, what made this possible was electrifying the implement. Before, before we electrified it, you could maybe go five miles an hour, not even 10 miles an hour, because we have the precise control. And if you know exactly how fast you're going, just throw the seed backwards at the exact opposite seed, speed, it drops straight. You can do that when you're electrified. And now since you know exactly where it is, really precise actuation, you can dose it with fertilizer as well. One more example of the power of kind of the basic technology. I don't know how many of you remember the derecho storm in 2020. Really, really nasty. A lot of Iowa got crops just leveled before they got harvested. Without the ability to know exactly, you, you couldn't see the roads. You had no visual indicators. Without Probably, it's also worth noting it's 600 and, 600 and some horsepower power, but the fact that we knew exactly where, they, where we were, that's the only thing that got the crop in that fall. Again, the power kind of baseline of technology. Okay, enough kind of foundational stuff. Uh, let's talk a little bit about AI in, in, in precision agriculture. I've, I've bucketed this, and this, these four buckets is something that John Reed and I came up, came up with for a talk we did uh, oh, a year or so ago. Um, but I'm going to buck, bucket these AI use cases into these four different categories, and I'm going to give you a couple examples of each. I'll we'll talk a little bit about AI improving machine performance, AI augmenting human performance, AI multiplying human performance, and AI exceeding human performance. And I'm going to say again, you guys can ask a question at any point. I don't know whether you're fascinated or bored stiff, but you're giving me really bad feedback by not asking any questions. So if only out of pity, ask me a question as we go here. Um, let's start with machine performance. Really simple example. This is a feature we've had for, uh, I want to say most of a decade now. If you don't use the highest end Starfire, you know, GPS directions to know exactly where you are, simple camera to look down the rows, figure out what's straight, and help you locate the equipment. Really simple AI example. If you do have GPS, you can fuse that together with your GPS localization. They did an even better estimate 
maybe uh, if you're in a region that has connectivity problems, it can help bridge you through that. Just a simple mono camera. And I, I want to say we first deployed this in 2016. So most of a decade. Simple example of how AI improves the machine performance by making it drive in straighter rows. Combine advisor. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about the complexity of a combine. You know, this is, what is it, 40,000 pounds, 20,000 parts, 3,000 parts in the header alone. And to make that thing switch from, from harvesting wheat to har harvesting corn, you just put a different header on it to change some settings. This is a mobile factory. You start with a full crop, you suck it in, you, you, you separate off the high value stuff, you chop everything else that isn't high value up and you shoot it out the back, spread it uniformly, and then that becomes organic material that goes back into the soil. It's all happening, uh, you know, 10 miles an hour in the field or faster. It, it's a mobile factory. We're at the point now where there's so much going on. If you've been inside the cockpit, the, the cab of a, of a tractor, it is, or, or a combine, it's fighter jet complex. There's really too much going on for an operator to make all the decisions on their own. They've probably got three different screens that they're looking at all at once. A couple of them are from us, a couple of them are some up from other company for some other app they run. So a few years ago, we introduced a, a system called Combine Advisor where the operator can make choices of what it values most. Does, it value, does, the, value, does the operator value finishing faster or does the operator value um, damaging the grain less? sets those parameters and then the system manages the performance for it and, and then it, it, it adjusts the system performance essentially again this is a factory it's changing all the speeds and feeds for you does that there, there's a number of components that build into that solution part of it is a couple of more cameras and you're going to see a theme we really like cameras we've really doubled down on vision as a technology um, Part of what it uses is those cameras then to watch the condition of the grain. And you can see in the bottom, the bottom right there, you can see where, where the image has highlighted kernels that it thinks are damaged. It's saying, hey, I think we might be running too fast. We're damaging more of the grain than you wanted. We're going to slow down a little bit. Without the cameras in there, you, you would, you'd have a hard time knowing that. And, and so dynamically, in real time, the combine adjusts the, the mobile factory, if you will. So that the operator can just think about what well, market they want to sell on or make sure they're, but they're, and they're also, they're not driving, right? The system's taking care of that form as well, because it, it, the, the localization handles that. So combine advisor is another great example of improving machine performance. Another interesting one, and I gotta take a sip of water here. It's called Harvest Lab. There's a, there's a near-infrared sensor inside of, the, uh, inside of the combine that is measuring grain as it comes through. And then based on that, it's able to measure uh, starch, protein, moisture content, oil for a number of crops. And then in, that it, can re it can report that to you, what's happening in the field. That data gets stored in operations center or online system. And depending on those attributes, that might make you choose differently how you want to sell it and where you want to sell it, because it has a different value. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you for asking a question. Yeah, Even I, if it's out of pity, I'm going to take no, it. No, I have a ton of questions. I Great. Have an animal. So right now I'm wondering, like, what uh, visibility do the purchasers have into this? So, like, if someone's going fast to destroy a lot of grain, like, what motivation do they have to up the quality? Because visually, like, a uh, buyer... Yeah, it's a commodity, quality. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fair question. I think it depends on the use, right? You know, depend, in some cases, the condition of it matters more than others also. Um, all of this data, all, all the data that you're collecting that's stored in operations center, if you're a grower, you can share it with whomever you want. Um, you control that, so if you had a, if your customer wanted access to that data, you can grant them access to that data. Pretty granular. I think I'd say it's a commodity. It depends on the market that you're selling it into, how much that initial condition matters. But we let the grower decide who sees it. We don't decide that for them. We let them manage their data. Does it also measure, like, I think it's called Erga, the grain mold that is still, like, harming livestock? I don't know if we measure I don't think we measure that. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, all right. Laura's getting a message there. Um, another one. Uh, now, another one talking about 
now we're switching to talking about augmented human performance here, instead of machine performance. This is a self-propelled forage harvester on the, on the bottom, and then you've got a tractor pulling a grain cart on the top. Between those two pieces of equipment, it's about a million dollars north of that. Actually, it's also about a thousand horsepower. And think about how, how, how do you fill that grain cart uniformly when you're going pretty fast down the field and you don't really have good line of sight with the other operator. Um, and the faster you go, the faster you get done. And, and, and you know, you're probably dealing with weather events that, that and, and you know, in the US, I think 93% of farmers have off-farm income. Farming is a part-time job for them, so they're doing it late at nights, so they're doing it on the weekends. So getting in and out of the field fast is of value. This is a case where this was work, I think, I think Carnegie Mellon did this one for us, NRAC out of CMU. Again, another camera. You tell the system how you want that thing filled, and then it just moves the auger for you. You stay alongside, and then it dynamically adjusts to fill that truck uniformly. You get it filled more uniformly, you get it filled faster, and you can keep going through the field faster as well. Great use of technology. And, you know, again, you're, you're getting the job done faster. We've had enough technology problems getting this set up that I'm not going to click on the YouTube link, but you can find a YouTube video of active fill control if you're interested. Another, um, you know, way to improve human performance, since we know where all the equipment is in the field, um, and we know how fast it's moving, we can also now help the operators um, determine where they want the grain cart to be. So if you've been in a field at harvest, you know, you can fit lots of bushels in that hopper, but, uh, you know, a, a combine will fill several semi-trailers of grain over the course of the day. So grain carts are coming in and out to it. Now we've got enough data about how these systems run that we can say, hey, um, you're going to be full of about 1,000 feet that way. You need to make sure you get a grain cart here before then. Here's where the five grain carts are in your field. Bring them to you. What's the AI piece of that? It's the algorithm that estimates when you're going to get full. It takes time. You have to know something about how much is in the field. You have to know about how fast you're moving. But a great example of using all of that data to keep the equipment moving, which keeps the operator, keeps the grower and the operators productive. If you get it just right, you might be able to say, you know, normally I'm running six grain carts, I'm confident enough in the system I'm only going to run five. You save a little bit of money, that's certainly a good thing, but getting labor on the farm is hard. So that, that labor reduction is really about, you know, whether, whether you can run your operation the way you want to or not. It's another good example. Now, this is something we just started doing a couple of years ago, and for a lot of years we told ourselves, you know, it's not our job to, to think about the agronomy of this. Like, we're an equipment company. But we have the largest agronomic data set in the world, and we started to realize we maybe have an obligation to share some insights with our customers. So we started saying over the last couple of years, hey, you know, in your neck of the woods, if we look at everybody else and everything we know, maybe you should plant beans before corn instead of after. That, that was new for us. It was really a stretch for us. We felt like, you know, Midwest humble, don't want to tell you how to do your job. But when you've got the data, why not share that insight? Um, our, our customers have been really receptive to that idea, that, that, and, and uh, we, we think we're very good stewards of their data. We only share those kinds of insights if they want us to. We never use that data to sell other products, but we have found value in, in sharing back those insights. And again, when you've got the data, we've got the data scientists, why, why would we not say, hey, here's the best time to plant. Here's the best time to plant. Do what you want, but here's the best time. So another example of uh, increasing human performance. Here's one where we've not augmented human performance. We've actually replaced human labor. This is our autonomous tractor. This is, uh, this is a tillage <coughs> operation. So tillage happens at a couple of times during the year. It either happens at fall, right during harvest, often right after harvest, or it happens in spring, right before planting. Those are busy times of years for farmers. So they would love to have the tractor just go do its thing because they maybe can't get an operator for it. Um, so what's it do? Well, it, it just drives the field and 
if it gets itself in trouble, and this is why ag was able to get to autonomous solutions first. If it gets in trouble, it just stops. You can't do that if you're a plane. You can't do that if you're a boat. You can't really do that if you're a car. So between the advantage of really advanced localization technology and a safe state that means stopping, that's how ag, I'll say, won the autonomy race. Um, this is a you know this is a system that's in customer hands. You start it with your smartphone. It gives you updates with your smartphone. If it gets in trouble, it sends you a picture and says, "I'm not quite sure what I'm looking at. Do you want me to wait here or can I just go?" And then that data goes back into the data set, and, and we learn from it. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later. This is the first production step we've made fully autonomous, but we've been clear that we'll have a fully production fully autonomous production system for corn and beans in the U.S. by 2030. So, clear, what question? Yeah? Is there a driver on the platform? Say again, is there a driver? Yeah. No, no, fully autonomous. And we've been, the question was there, is there a driver in the tractor? No, there's not. We've been, you know, 95, 98% autonomous for, for years. You know, it's been self-driving for a good long time. What we really had to do was get a, rich enough safety system in place. So there's three sets of stereo cameras. And in a field, you can, you can oversimplify a field and say it's, it's, a, it's a straight, it's a plane. See something sticking out of the plane, you need to address that. You can, you can classify it, you can keep going. If you can't, you stop. It takes a lot of work to make all that real. But that simple idea is what, is what makes it possible to have a fully autonomous tractor. Yeah, go ahead. So well, the farmers adjust because I know a, a large majority of the farmers are older. Yeah. And I know, and, and they don't adjust well to change. So I hear that a lot. I, I, I mean, my dad was a farmer. Yeah. So. Yeah, I hear that a lot that they don't adjust well to change, but maybe think of it this way. Um, middle of the last century, about half of the U.S. farmed. Now it's less than 1%. What got them there? It's technology, period. It's technology. They have less labor. What else is there? They also have less land and fewer resources. It's technology. These are really savvy business people that swallow an amazing amount of risk. They'll adopt technology. They're going to be smart about it, but I think, I think we think about farmers um, I often hear that, you know, how conservative they are, and they're just shrewd business people. I'm a veteran. Yeah. So, I, I became a computer programmer in uh -huh. high school, and, and my dad was like, I am not buying one of those things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so that's where I come from. Yeah. I mean, you know, 25 years ago, no one used, you know, auto track to steer the tractor because it wasn't a thing. Now the vast majority of farmers don't steer their tractor anymore. They just let the system take, take care of it. Um, I, I guess I would say there's fewer farmers um, that, that can't get help. That they need technology, so they're they're, they're not going to do it if it doesn't work for them. We have to we have to prove them, but they'll adopt it. If there's business value, they'll adopt it. Yeah, there's a question in the back, I think. Great question. Que gentleman's question was, is like, does this build on an existing one or do they have to go buy a new one? Um, I mean, we always think you should go buy a new one. You know, that's always a good solution. But this is really building on a very thick technology stack. So if it's new enough, you, it, it can become an add-on kit for sure. Yeah, but, but I mean, for years, it's been drive-by-wire, which gets you so much of the way there. If everything is a message, on a CAN bus that gets you so much of the way to being able to do this. So um, if it's new enough, it becomes an event. It's not a whole new product. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is literally decades of work to get to this point. It took a lot of careful planning. Good question. Other yeah. questions? In the back, yeah. Quick question. Uh, so if, if you have a blown-out fuel tile and you've got a big hole, how would your systems... How would this handle it if it, if it, if it saw a big hole? Yeah. Or if it is. Yeah, well if, it, well, if it didn't see it, that'd be bad. Um, that'd be bad if you were in the cab too, right? And those things do happen. If it saw it, it would stop. If it saw something it didn't understand, it would stop and you would get an image on your phone. It'd be like, hey, I don't know what to do about this. What do you want me to do? 
And if you didn't think it was anything, send it back on its way, otherwise it stops and waits for you. And that is a big advantage. Being able to do that is a big advantage. And our ability to do that confidently is what determined when the product came to market. Yeah, good question. Yeah. With uh, how much information is being sent back, so yeah. it's keep these things running. If there was a, a big event, like things were hacked and went down for a big while, would someone be able to get in the cab and finish off? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the question is like, does this only run autonomously? Uh, no, it doesn't. Great, that's a great question. Um, yeah, you still got to get into the field. You know, you, you still, we, we, we consider autonomy a feature. Um, and, and I think that's a really important choice. I, you know, you, you see the capitalist tractors and, and that's a thing, but how do you get it there? You know, like, you, you know, so we find it useful. And then you're gonna use this for the other steps of the year that aren't fully autonomous, you still need to be able to get in there. Also, you make a lot of money selling really nice cabs. Like, cabs are a really profitable feature for us. We don't wanna get rid of that yet. And customers like being you know, where the money's being made. So it, 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 autonomy is a feature here. That's a great question. Anything else? This is fun. Go ahead. So, I don't know. Has there been anything with oh, AI or technology replacing us or taking jobs away from us? Basically. Is AI taking jobs away in ag? Right. Yeah, I, I think I would say um, globally, farmers have a tough time getting help. Um, so, you know, I guess if you were a it, it, one view of the world would be AI is, is taking jobs, technology is taking jobs, AI is one of those. Another view of the world would be these folks need help, they can't get labor, let's solve the problem of technology. And I would suggest that farms, first, uh, um, a productive and secure society starts with a, with, a, with a food supply. Like having a stable and solid food supply is like at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. For, for a society. And when it takes fewer people to generate that stable food supply, that's what, you know, country after country, being kids being able to leave the farm is a part of what creates a prosperous middle class. That's a part of what lets you go get a manufacturing job. That's a part of what lets you go to college. So I, I think, and I, I fully acknowledge, acknowledge my bias. It's, I've been a deer 25 years. I'm proud to be a deer. But I think technology on the farm is, is a good thing for the world because it lets people not have to come back to the farm if they don't want to. So yes, it does reduce labor, but that labor is what is part of what creates a prosperous middle class, lets them do other things. Yeah, question in the back, yeah. This is fascinating. Will this presentation be available uh, online? <coughs> yeah. sure. I have no idea. The question was if the presentation will be available yeah. online. I know it's streaming now. I don't know if it's being recorded. Groovy. Yeah. You said he was live over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, um, so you were talking earlier about the electric capabilities, the precision and vocational precision. I also saw on the slide before that you had some solar panel things. So I'm wondering, like, uh, like it was on an early slide, okay. like some things with solar panels. So I was just trying to check out, like, um, what are what's going on right now with the technology to make that electrical capabilities last longer? And then part of that is solar supplementation. Is yeah. that reducing the accuracy? I'm not down that there's solar cells on a slide. I'm not thinking of which one that is. We, we are not actively researching solar. We are aware that solar continues to be more and more productive, more and more energy density. Um, if, if it can power a tractor, we're interested. You know, and there's, there's a lot of ways to get there. I, my, my assumption is that a fully autonomous, like, you know, that tractor, so it's an 8R, I don't know why, I'm, I'm thinking that's, I can't read on it. I guess that's 410 horsepower or something like that. We're a long, long, if, if I stick batteries everywhere you can stick them, it, it'll still run for maybe an hour or two. If, if I, 
if we could make a fully electric tractor, it takes uh, the energy of 38 long-range Tesla 3s to generate enough power for, for that tractor to keep running all day. And if you did that, it would quadruple the cost, <laughs> quadruple the weight, and destroy the soil. So today, I know it's not there. We see ourselves as uh, very active in battery technology, but solar is something we'd be more watching. I would not be at all surprised to find that someday. Go ahead. Health monitoring of the equipment. Of, yeah, so the question is, has AI been used for you know, monitoring the health of the equipment? Uh, yeah, we do quite a lot of that. Um, some in real time on the equipment, a lot of that data comes back home and we're able to do certainly diagnostics. In some cases, we're getting to the point where we really can do prognostics. So then we reach out to the dealer and say, hey, you need to contact this customer and you need to get out in the next couple of days to replace this part before it fails. Um, that's been probably a 15 year journey. That's one of the first things we've started to get from the telematics, having all that data coming back home. Good question. Go ahead. Are any of your sensors listening sensors that are listening for audio problems? Yeah, good question is, are we, are we using audio to listen for problems? And, and I love that question because there are so many sensing modalities that the human brings, right? Um, that, and and one, of the, one of the challenges for more and more autonomy is how do we replace all those capabilities? Uh, I think what I can say is we've had a number of projects looking at that over the years. We also find that a lot of times um, something that manifests as sound often also manifests as vibration or other things like that. So there can be, with almost anything you want to sense, there's more than one way to get there. Yeah, great. Another question. Go ahead. Uh, are you having uh, problems finding enough technicians to keep all of this incredible equipment? Yeah, the question was, you know, are we having problems finding enough technicians? I think, our, I think our dealers would say that continues to be a challenge. And, you know, the thing of it is, like, if you want to work with technology, this is, there's a great career to be had as an equipment technician. I wish more people knew that that was an option. Um, we continue to work with, we and all the large ag companies continue to work with, you know, with junior colleges and, and with, with other, there are a lot of ways to get those skills. Um, I think that's part of what's driven some of the consolidation of some of the, some of the dealer channel is, is sharing those resources better. That, that is a challenge. And I mean, this stuff's just cool. This is, if you, if you are, you know, if someone who's technically minded and wants a career but maybe doesn't want to go the four-year degree route, this is a great way to go. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, interoperability, like, how, how well does it uh, talk to other systems besides just here? Or interoperability, how well does it talk to other systems besides here? Well, I don't even understand the question because I think you should only buy green tractors. <laughs> um, it does vary. It, it, it does vary for sure. Um, I mean, like, interoperability in ag goes all the way back to PTO three-point pitch, right? There's all kinds of not modern innovations that are very much based around interoperability. There are some standards around electrification that lets a green tractor pull a red implement and let share power to it. Um, the, the data goes to the cloud in, in John Deere Operations Center. There are a lot of agreements that let other folks put data in or consume data from Operations Center. They're pretty easy to use API. Um, interoperability, you know, like the problem with standards in ag isn't that there aren't enough, it's that there's too many and there's work to do there for sure. But we're, you know, we recognize that there are very few entirely green farms. There certainly should be more, but there are very few. So we, 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 we'd have to live in a, a multicultural world. Yeah. All right, um, oh, one more, go ahead. Do, do you, um offer any solutions to farmers if they live in areas where they may not be able, like it may not be efficient to move data from the field to the cloud, for example? Yeah, the question is about if you're in, a, if you're in maybe a, a rural area that doesn't have good connectivity, how do you get data around there? Yeah, I mean, some of these solutions go way back. And, I mean, like, if the best you can do is a thumb drive, 
at the end of the day, you take all the data from the computer back to your PC and upload it there. We still need to support that. And for a lot of these solutions, before a 4G world, that's kind of how they had to work, right? Um, now, autonomy assumes a real-time connection, but most of these solutions, you know, we don't have any shortage of power. We can run all kinds of compute locally. So a lot of these solutions, the intelligence isn't sitting in the cloud, it's sitting locally. Um, so yeah, if the best you can do is, is, a, is a thumb drive to get data to the PC at the end of the day, we are getting to the point where that, there are some limitations there, but most of this doesn't assume continuous connectivity. There's a lot of smart something equipment. Yeah. I will say related to that, um, uh, you know, I think in the, in the US it's about 90% of about 90% of farm acres have 4G or 5G. It's pretty good. Uh, so that means 10% don't. And it doesn't seem likely that that's going to change. The US is, is better than lots of countries. You know, so if you go to Brazil, you have a 50,000 acre farm, and most of it doesn't have any connectivity. So we've explored, um, does, a, does a private 4G connection make sense? Um, and then just, uh, what, a few weeks ago, we announced a partnership with, with SpaceX to start using Starlink, where it makes sense. Um, you know, now that's, those, those LEO satellites are just over every little while. It's not, a conti it's not continuous connectivity, but does it get the data back home every day? It seems like a good way to do that. So connectivity is something that continues to be a, a challenge. Um, not a barrier, but definitely a challenge. I think I've got one more use case I want to cover here. This is a this is a case where we're not um, we're not replacing labor. We're really just exceeding human performance and doing things that that a, that a person couldn't do. I've got a video running here of sea and spray. This is a solution, um, 120 foot boom, with uh, 36 cameras across it. About 300 teraflops of compute power, if you like to think that way. That's about how much was used to sequence the human genome. Um, and uh, in real time, we're identifying weed versus plant and then spraying. It sounds crazy to say if you don't come from an ag background, but before this, you just sprayed everything all the time. And then plant genetics decided that that plant was smart enough to, to, to not be susceptible. To, the, to that chemical that was going to kill the weed. Um, this is really an amazing system. It's an amazing amount of compute. You get about 16 milliseconds to make a decision on whether you're going to spray or not. And, and you get maybe five pictures if you're lucky, if things are ideal. And, and, and then just having the nozzle be reactive enough to spray that fast is really a stunning mechanical achievement. Um, you, reduce the, you reduce the amount of chemicals that you put in the field by between two thirds and three quarters, which is good for everybody except the people that sell chemicals. So it's really, really an impressive solution. Also real in customer hands now. Um, and then you get this cool side effect. You get this weed pressure map now. And like, you didn't have this data before. You know where your weeds are in the field. And that means maybe you would have changed how you would approach that um, next year. Um, this one we just announced this week. I just added this slide this morning. Uh, combine predictive ground speed. So we talked about how we're automating the performance of the combine inside earlier. Here, you know, like the combine, it's like a adaptive cruise control for, for a combine. It, it, it looks ahead and it's like, wow, that's a lot of grain. I'm gonna slow down before I get to that so it can process it, more, uh, process it better. Anyone that's been in a combine knows how jumpy it gets, right? When, when, it's, when it's just overburdened, this helps solve that problem. It's two sets of stereo cameras on front, and then some satellite data that's preloaded um, from, from you know, a, 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 that, that's recent. Put those together and you get a smoother ride. This is critical for making this system fully autonomous in, in the future. And then furrow vision. This is another one I was able to add. Yeah, so um, let me stop that, see if I can stop that. Well, no, okay, on the left here, what I'm showing you is just how this thing is looking in the furrow and determine residue. It can see the seed. On the right, that's how fast it's actually happening. Like a human's not going to do that. Besides the fact that it's 20 feet behind you on the implement, um, a human just can't 
process how fast things are happening. So we can see the seed, we can see how deep the furrow is. If you want to maintain your furrow at two inches, this will tell you whether you're maintaining that or not. Another great camera usage. I talked briefly about this AI, and uh, I'm talking about uh, SpaceX, and I also talked about fully autonomous production system, and there are some pictures of dogs. <laughs> we'll end on that. I think probably about time to wrap up, yeah? Any other questions for Mark? Go ahead. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll say for the group, if you've got to give it a go somewhere, you should go now, and I'm not going to take offense, but I'm glad to take a couple more questions. Uh, I was really hoping you were going to have questions about the dogs, but we <laughs> can talk about trackers. Yeah, 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 so what can generative AI do for ag tech? Um, uh, Generative AI needs to get through its hype cycle. Right now, there's a lot of overpromise and underdelivery. Right? If, if, if generative AI, if ChatGPT were an employee, I would fire it because it's a misogynist who lies and doesn't follow directions. Um, I think there's a ton of potential, but I think we're a long way from reaching it. I say that, that doesn't mean we're ignoring it. We're like every company, we're, we're actively working in that space, but there are some real architectural struggles that we have to get through first. I'm really interested in um, a move towards more open models. I'm really interested in you know, small language models that we're starting to hear some things about. But man, the idea that you could, you could use that as an expert system, um, I think that's super interesting. I just think right now it's a fairly dangerous idea. When I think about when generative AI goes off the rails, that's not something I'm interested in putting in production anytime soon. Yeah. Other questions? Go ahead in the back. Red recently that is a word for the invention of an artificial nitrogen fertilizer that the world population would attack the realm of your ability. And I see developments in the technology that also has the ability to grow the population. But I'm wondering, it also seems like maybe it's the opportunity for more points of failure in terms of some sort of cataclysm. Like if have this technology and we're dependent on it to be the people of the world, what is your view on like resilience in the face of some kind of obstacle like that? Well, I do think your, your point there is important. We are dependent on it. So like, it's not optional. People starve if this technology goes away. So like that's, I think you have to acknowledge that's the alternative, right? Um, yeah, the Green Revolution and, and, and the changes that came through the use of synthetic nitrogen broadly are, are really, really amazing. There's some downside to that too, right? All those, all those chemicals have um, definitely have some problems. So you look at technologies like sea and spray, more broadly we think about sense and act. What can we do to reduce all of those inputs over time? System resilience, that's something as we focus more as an enterprise on systems engineering over these last 20 years and start thinking about not just the system, but the system of systems continues to become more important for us. Um, I see it as a trade-off. The, 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 um, a world that eats better than it used to is a good thing. It, it, it's simply a trade-off. But but you're right. There are complex systems do have risk. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Anything else? A small question. Yeah. Go ahead. So so when you're designing some of these new features, um, so some, for something like a combine, is the combine considered like a platform, and then any new features that you develop over a certain period are kind of add-ons to the platform, or are some of these innovations just so big that someone would have to invest in an entirely new? Yeah, questions kind of about how, do, how what's our platforming strategy and what's the difference? How often do we do kind of a blank sheet of paper versus a model year refresh, and is that at a product level or is it broader than that? Um, Good question. Uh, you know, if you think about engines, that's not at a product level. That's across really many of our products. We do make our own engines. Um, if you think about things like our, our Starfire receiver, that goes, you know, the same receiver goes on really all of our equipment. The Gen 4, now Gen 5 display, that's the same. So many of those building blocks we really have tried to standardize. It's good for our customers, it's good for our dealers, it's good for us to do that as well. Um, 
you know, a full blank piece of paper design. Uh, you know, the, the clock cycle of ag is slower than, certainly slower than a phone, certainly slower than a car. Um, for those, for those hard iron components, we don't often start from scratch. Um, there is a model year cycle associated with it. You know, where it's the incremental improvements. I guess I'll say we have a, a, a long enough window into where we want to go that I think we do a pretty good job of saying, hey, we're going to make this a feature instead of making you buy a new piece of equipment. Also, you know, aftermarket sales, like if you like your tractor, keep it. We're happy to sell you more parts. That's a really good business. So um, for someone developing a lot of these technologies, they, like within those small teams, they kind of have that in mind when they're building them out. Like if they know that we're going to need to put cameras and certain locations okay. where they're not already there. It depends on how early you are in the technology cycle. Like, so if you're a group like mine that is, you know, we don't think about the next product, we think about the next, next product. Like we don't, or maybe we think about, you know, we're, we're much more worried about what's, what's possible than okay. maybe what customers okay. are directly asking for. So I really challenge my team to be very unconstrained initially, because that's where breakthroughs come from. Um, but yeah, once you start, you know, Realizing that you're not trying to violate the laws of physics and you know a few other, you know that this is possible, then you do start thinking, okay, what's already out there? And maybe it, in some cases you're like, bang, I can use that exact camera right there. In other cases, you're like, well, I'm going to take that same camera and put it somewhere else. We 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 try to be mindful of the of the reuse whenever we can. But if, if it's an important enough feature, yeah. Yeah, and our customers are going to keep us honest there, right? If it's it really value, they're not going to buy it. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. What kind of data do you to make your I didn't hear the last part of that. Oh, this is basically like images from the most Yeah, the question is what, what is the data that's making that thing autonomous? I think. All models are wrong, some are useful, some of the brutes would be a really massive simplification here, right? Um, a lot of the autonomy is very similar to when these things were self driving. Like you're just sitting in the cab, this thing's just driving up and down really by itself already. The data there, that's the that's that's the, the GPS data and then the the Starfire correction and then the path planning. You know, that's what's having it just go up and down the roads. Then the three pairs of stereo cameras, you can largely think of that as the safety system. Then it says, well, hang on, this is, I, I'm not expecting to find anything in front of me right now. So a lot of it is, you know, the, the, the Starfire system that gives you the, lo the location and then operation center where we've, we've already built a path plan, you're executing that path plan, and then the cameras are kind of driving the section. Yeah, good question. All right, that's it. Okay, thanks everyone.